Here in a moment, we're going to look at one of the most strategic verses, I think, in, uh, in Scripture when it relates to God's truth. And we're talking about six lies American Christians believe. This isn't, uh, this isn't everybody. This is American Christians buy into, and that's how we're addressing this. Now, here's, here's the one for today, and you've heard this idea that all religions, all ways are, are just different ways up the same mountain. Are you familiar with that, that illustration? That all these paths uh, from these different religions, there's different paths, and the person on a particular path, they think, this is the only path. And this person on the other side of the mountain, they're coming up a different path, but they think, my path's the only path. But when they all get to the top, they look around and they say, well, look at all these other people up here. And look at all the other paths from up here. I've been mistaken my whole life. There are actually multiple ways to get up this mountain. I wish that I had known this earlier. Now, the mountain analogy, and it is used often, sounds uh, very humble. And it, it also repels people who would disagree with it because they come off feeling ignorant and small-minded and arrogant to be claiming that their way is the only way and that's how they're attacked as well. That, well, you're just, you don't see the big picture. You don't, you don't, you're too stuck in your little rut to see the greater truth. But in the mountain illustration, the question I've, I've always had is, for this person who sees all the different paths and all this, where are they? I, I think there must be in a helicopter over here so they can see the whole mountain because they're, they have a different perspective than the rest of, of us uh, sluggards who are just slugging our way up the mountain. Meanwhile, they have a great, great enlightenment to see the entire mountain while the rest of us are just making our way up our individual paths. This person with that uh, helicopter perspective is called a relativist. And a relativist would say there is, there is no more to truth than your personal or cultural belief. That truth is whatever you want truth to be. And you, you define truth for yourself. You can't define it for others, but you can define it for yourself. So, why is the relativist the only one who gets to have a helicopter while the rest of us are sweating up the road in ignorance? Well, the relativist is not giving us a lovely picture of openness, in fact, not at all. This is the part of the argument that it may be helpful to you if you have someone who has this viewpoint, and not to be mean-spirited about it, you need to be gracious, you need to be kind in how you say it, how you approach it, but to say, well, isn't isn't the relativist view the, well, no, it's not, I believe Christianity is the way, or I believe this is the way, or I believe this is the way, or I believe this is the way. Those are exclusive models. So is the relativist. Because the relativist just has his own exclusive model that says, no, all of your models are wrong, and only my model is right. Here's the difference, though. The relativist doesn't have any foundational authority for his viewpoint except his own opinion about it. We talked a few weeks ago about the authority of Scripture, the reliability of the Word of God, how it has been proven and tested and all those things. We have that at least, where the relativist, it's just his opinion off the top of his head. And it's as exclusive and it's, a, it's as harsh and wrong as anything they would accuse you of. Now, one can't, can't get past this one without talking about the person that talks about this most in public forums over the last several years, our friend Oprah. And she is bought into this at every level. It's wrong to believe, she says, that Jesus is the only way, and that view should be rejected for its arrogance. Yet the person who claims all paths lead to God is just making, is making up their own religion and their own exclusive, narrow-minded, unsupported by authority claim to truth. So... Don't let people back you into a corner or intimidate you and don't buy into the lie. Followers of Jesus Christ, and I'm talking about, and by the way, a lot of followers of Jesus Christ are no closer to Christ than 
any of those world religions that we would say are very far from Christ. Followers of Jesus Christ who believe the Bible is their authority. Not just a suggestion book, but our authority believe the big view does not come from a worldly philosopher sharing their opinions, but the view of what is truth and what is forgiveness and what is restoration to wholeness in our lives and what is eternity. And the only way to get there comes from Jesus Christ. He is Savior and He is Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords. And I'm not going to listen too much to the worldly philosopher talking about this, but I will listen to what Jesus said about it. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe the Word of God, and it's hard not to do those two things at the same time, then what Jesus said in John 14 is going to be very important to us. John 14 has so much stuff. Uh, we've done whole series for, we've done six weeks at a time in John 14 alone. Uh, here is John 14 verse 1, and here's what Jesus said. This is just before, Jesus is about to be arrested. He's with his disciples. The cross is right on the horizon for him. The disciples know this. He has been saying over and over again, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested, beaten, killed. Three days later, I'm going to rise again. And the disciples just keep looking at him saying, what in the world does that mean? Uh, sometimes words have significance in the Bible, especially when Jesus says them. You might want to tune into what that is because words have meaning. Well, these words have meaning. Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus declared, there's only one way to have a relationship to God, eternity in heaven, in that place he's going to prepare. And that's through faith in him. Now we're calling this series Lies American Christians Believe because, because we get sucked into these false beliefs. They're so prominent and so uh, all around us that we, we can get pulled into these false teachings. Do you know how you know if you've been sucked into this one? Do you know how you know if you've compromised on this one? There are a lot of different ways, but, but this is the clearest way. You know that you've been pulled into this. That really, all religions go to heaven. No religion goes to heaven. Jimmy talked about this a couple weeks ago. Everybody goes to heaven. We get sucked into those lies of our culture because we stop and we, how you know you stop caring about the spiritual lostness of the people around you and in your world you don't worry about it you're not concerned about it if you're not talking to people about your faith living out your faith boldly with other people reaching out to your circles of influence in your world about about the love of God demonstrated through his son Jesus Christ a big reason that that stops happening is because we've bought into the big lie at some level that just insulates us from feeling any responsibility for lostness around us. It, catch, it captures us more quickly than we like to think. The reason we start believing the big lie, and I'll tell you this, it's not because you're a terrible person. It's not because I'm a terrible person. That's not why we start believing this lie. It's because it's just more convenient to believe the lie. It doesn't mess up your life so much. It doesn't get into your business so much. It doesn't, it doesn't ask you to do anything. And the other reason, because we're, not really, we're never that far from junior high, we just want to fit in. We want to blend in with everybody else. We don't want to stand out. We want everybody to like us. So we don't want to be odd man out in, in a circle of people. And so we, we buy into the big lie. Now let's go back to this idea that all religions or even no religion will lead us to the same place. This is this idea. And one thing you need, to, you need to learn, and Christians, this is one of our 
things that we, we've talked about, uh, trying to take more steps to challenge you in, is we've got to be a thinking people. We're, we're just really lazy, and we don't try very hard, and we don't, we don't, th- there's a lot to learn about how to do this well, and to, there's study, and there's effort, and we've got to get better at that side of it. So, one of the things is you just need to know there are big differences between these world religions. When, when someone says, they're all the same. They're all the same. They all believe the same things. They're all doing the same things. They're all going the same direction. You just need to do a little study because even, even a surface skimming the surface level of understanding world religions, you discover they, have ex- they all have ex- exclusive truth claims. They don't believe the same thing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through this really fast. I've spent, we've done seminars where we've talked about this. Some of you have done this in your BFG classes and discipleship classes. I've done it where we break out world religions and we talk about what they believe. And you say, how could anybody say that they're all the same? They're not even close to the same. Here's just a quick survey. When it comes to God, just, you're going, how about this? You're going up the mountain. What God do you find at the top? How about that? So, in Buddhism, they deny there's a personal God. You get to heaven, the top of the mountain, there's not a God there. In fact, you're just absorbed into the big collective unconscious. You cease to exist as an individual. That's that's Buddhism. That's a little different than what we talk about in Christianity, isn't it? Yes, it is. Do you agree with that? Good. Good. because I'm going to have to backpedal and start with some more basic things if you don't go with me on that one. Uh, we're in real trouble on the rest of this message. Here's the second thing. Uh, Hinduism. In Hinduism, believe in many gods. Uh, some, may be, and it may be an animal. It may be a hero uh, who thought of as a god. And in Hinduism, you can worship any of them, all of them, but there are thousands of different gods. And one of the challenges in Interacting in Hinduism is sometimes there is a tendency to say, yeah, I'll take one more. I'll be glad to add Jesus to my list. However, you know, today, today, Christians are being brutally persecuted large parts of India by uh, Hindus. They're killing Christians and they're burning churches. Because the great openness of we'll accept other gods, just add another to the pantheon, that great sense of openness. But see, Christians say, there's only one God. It's only one way. And because of that exclusiveness of Christianity, that open-minded Hinduism, they're killing Christians and burning down their churches. Because uh, come to find out, it's different. Jesus is not just a Savior. He is the Savior. Muslims, uh, in Islam, they're monotheistic, one God. But that God, it's not a relationship based on love, like we talk about in the scriptures here. It's based on fear. The God is uh, impersonal. He is unknowable. And there are differences in relationship to the Trinity, that Islam will deny the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But they will say, but Jesus was a great prophet. He was one of the prophets. That's just a lot different than what we find in Christianity. Uh, we'll throw in Mormonism. Mormons will quickly tell you, we're Christians. We're Christians just like you. And I've had that conversation multiple times in our city. And they say, in Mormonism, if you manage to reach the top, you get to the top of the mountain, you're God. See, that makes it different, right? You don't find God up there. You may find you up there. If you get all the way to the top, you're God. The God, of, the God of planet Earth, he was a mortal man on some other planet. He really pleased the God of that planet. And because of that, through obedience to that God's precepts, he attained exaltation or Godhood through this process of eternal progression. The God, the Mormon God of this planet was a guy who became a God. And you know, if you do this really well here for this God... Maybe you'll get your own planet and you'll get to be God. That is not on the first page of the brochures. But it's deeply embedded in all things of their theology. Biblical Christianity. 
No, biblical Christians believe there's one God, and they also believe that God has revealed himself, made himself known, relates to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that creation, history, and humanity have great, great meaning. We're brought into being by a loving God, and he is caring and loving and gracious, and he takes the initiative in reaching down to us, reaching out to us in love, by grace, and inviting us to have a relationship to him. And that God's different than all those other gods. Dramatically, dramatically different. I'm just saying that's it. These are not the same. When it comes to salvation, how is every, all, the, all these religions say there's a brokenness in the world and there's a brokenness in lives. How do you fix what's broken? And they all have some plan for how you fix what's broken. So, and, and I am summarizing, how do you summarize uh, all of that in one sentence? Well, I'll tell you, like this. Hindus, uh, based on karma, getting off the reincarnation treadmill, uh, things you do, and it's all about do, D-O. It's all about what you do. Buddhists, it's based on the eightfold path. And you, take, you follow the principles of that eightfold path, and it's all based on what you do do with uh, Islam it's based on the five pillars of Islam you can mark it you can check the boxes it's all based on the five pillars it's all based on what you do the religious stuff you do in Mormonism the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints there are 12 steps boxes you check to get there and the better you do your checking of the boxes the better chance you have and it's all based on D-O what you personally do and then Christians and this is where it diverges dramatically because every other world religion is all based on what you do and then you get to Christianity and it's not based on what you do because you can't do anything it's based on what Jesus has done what he accomplished at the cross and in the resurrection. And that sets biblical Christianity. And by the way, I say biblical Christianity because a lot of expressions of Christianity are all based on do. It's all based on what you do. And a lot of people who are in Christian churches, some of you may, may have actually bought into this at some level or maybe in a pretty big way. It's going to be based on me being a really good person and living a good life and doing good stuff. But you know what? Biblical Christianity is not based on this. It's based on what Jesus has done for us at the cross. It's completely different. Now the reason this mountain climbing illustration makes so much sense to so many people is that we're just trying to earn our own way. We want it to work out the way we want it to work out. We want the process to work the way we want it to work. And so we have to climb the mountain to get to God. And the story of the Christian faith is not a story of us working to climb a mountain. The story of the Christian faith is God coming down to, to us in Jesus Christ. That's the story of the Christian faith. Now, one of the most familiar verses in the Bible tells a little of that. It says, for God so loved the world, and that's all of us broken people, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish separated from him for time and eternity but instead if you put your faith in him will have eternal life God says offer you a gift offer you a gift you can't earn it you certainly don't deserve it but I want to offer you this gift the Bible says for by grace unearned unmerited favor of God for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing it's the gift of God not as a result of your works Climbing the mountain. What you do, it's not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. We live, we live in this day of uh, buffet line spirituality. And people think, I'll just pick and choose. And I'm running into more and more people, it's a syncretism. They just mix it and match it. Where they say, I like this symbol from this religion. I like this tradition from this religion. I like these holidays. And, and I'm going to just put all this together and mix and match and create something that just fits me. Like going through, I went to see my parents uh, this weekend, Arkansas. 
And uh, my parents, I said, I'll go anywhere you want to go. My dad said, you know, I don't get to go. Your mother won't let me go here very often, but since you're here, she might. Some of you guys know how that works. And we went to this, it's a Chinese buffet. But the reason my dad likes it is because they have fried frog legs. So they've got, they've got fried catfish. They've got fried, they have a lot of sushi. They have uh, fried frog legs, uh, all the Pizza. There were there were a lot there was a lot going on in that place I tell you, and you know what I had? Well, I had some fried frog legs and I had some catfish and I had some uh, Chinese food that I like and I got some ice cream at the end. Uh, and and that was just one bad decision that I made this weekend. Now, a lot of people are putting together their 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 sense of the spiritual in the same kind of way. Uh, this, this particular thing I like the emotional experience I like the encouragement of this one I, I like how this one makes me feel and the appeal of the buffet line spiritual life is I design my own faith and then I'm in control right because ultimately the issue is control I want to control I want to manage this myself I don't want any <laughs> I, I don't want to have uh have some all-powerful God telling me how to do this. Uh, so we say, I, uh, mercy, love, grace, it's unconditional acceptance. Give me a double helping of that. Uh, Jimmy will talk about this next week. Uh, biblical sexual ethic, pass. Uh, what about Makes me more successful. Makes me feel better about myself as a person. Yeah, I'd like a lot of that. Repentance of sin, sacrifice on behalf of the poor of the world. No, I'm not interested in those things. I'm going to pick the things that I can control that make me just make my life easy and make it work the way I think it ought to work, really, with or without God. The appeal is it doesn't interfere with my life and it doesn't inconvenience me in any way. And there's nothing transcendent, no moral absolute authority to which I have to answer. No one that one day I will stand before as my, as my, as my judge for whom I will give a, an account for every word and every action of my life. I just look for what appeals to me, what's comforting to me, what's captivating to my mind, and I can reject anything that's inconvenient. And I think that's the appeal. Now, I gave you a whirlwind tour of world religions. Man, there's a lot more to dig into in that. And I have spent in the past two Sundays in a row just talking about world religions and differences between world religions and we've done multiple seminars hours and hours long where we break out world religions and we compare and contrast all these different views and they're great side by side charts of what the differences are on a variety of different things in relationship to world religions and I started this is a particular sermon I started into the whole thing developed the whole thing wrote the whole thing felt great about it and then I stepped back and looked at it and I scrapped the whole second half. So everything after this came later. Because the issue, and this is what I want you to get, the issue for you and for the people you're going to discuss this with, people who ask this question, aren't all religions the same? Doesn't everyone go to heaven? That's a nonsense question. This is the issue, and this is the one that we can't overlook, and we can't philosophically uh, leapfrog. Are you going to go to heaven? This is ultimately not about person X somewhere and their view, and let's argue and discuss and debate this. It's about your eternal soul, and that's where all this comes back uh, to rest. Jesus said there's only one way to go to heaven. And you can't make up your own way. And you can't expect that you're going to develop this buffet line spiritual life and then present it to God and say, this works, right? Some of you are going to go uh, after church and you're going to go to your favorite restaurant to eat. And you will order 
and you will enjoy your meal and then they're going to bring you a check and you can pay with cash or with a credit card and uh, just try I want you to try this because you're you're sharp people a lot of skill set here when they bring your check why don't you say I appreciate the gesture but today the currency with which I plan to pay for this meal that I have enjoyed very much I'm paying in smiles there's one there's two there's three I'm paying in smiles today because that's the currency of love and I am going to uh, work okay well then you know a couple hours later you're washing dishes because that's a terrible plan okay if your favorite restaurant won't accept you just making it whatever you want it to be there's a not a good chance just not a good chance that God creator of heaven and earth is going to accept just whatever you happen to throw his direction truth is always narrow in the gospel Jesus said I'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except by me the the all religions lead to God they do have a lot in common the variety of world religions and most of them have some version of the scales and the scales say I'm going to try to do more good things than bad things and if I can weigh it even 51% in my favor at the point I die if I'm at 51% well I'm probably going to get in whatever eternity is supposed to look like whatever heaven is supposed to look like whatever relationship to God is supposed to look like if I can just get that far I'm all good and all of them have something about that and truthfully most people who would say I'm a Christian are actually putting their faith in, in the scales and I hear, I hear that kind of language all the time well you know I'm a pretty good person I do nice things I, I go to church and probably enough I do enough good things I give enough money to good causes and if I think I have more good than bad and I just want to balance the scale out but here's the problem with that the God to whom we will answer is perfect what's the standard is the standard better than the person sitting next to you in church today is the standard 51% good no the standard is God he set the standard he's perfect pure holy without fault and that's the standard and we are going to come up way short when that is the standard God has no intention that his world that he created is going to be 50% 51% good God's plan for the human community is that it be unmarred by sin that it be whole and complete that what's broken in us and we feel that broken so what's broken in our world and we, feel, we sense the brokenness in our world today that it be whole and complete and perfect and pure and one day God's going to set that all right but you can't you can't earn that you can't fix that yourself you're really stuck in fact that's uh, the wage of sin is death and uh, all have sinned we're all broken God's original plan broken God wants to get back to the perfect plan God wants to take us back to purity and wholeness and holiness and we can't fix it ourselves so God's thrown us this life ring like a drowning man in the ocean he throws us the only hope we have we're going to perish as John 3.16 the word they use apart from it God sent to this earth a savior and he proved that this way to eternal life is the only way because Jesus was raised from the dead and that sets him apart from the rest of the religious leaders of the world and of history that one way is clear he is like no other and, and this is this is an important claim of biblical Christianity that human beings will be will be judged by a just God and that we we need somebody to save us to forgive us and again a lot of people just don't like that idea 
Well, I'm not that bad. I'm pretty good. I have my own plan. And no matter what the Bible says, no matter what Jesus said, I'm going with the self-style plan. Uh, one of the people who speaks a lot about this, and this was from an interview in USA Today a while back, an interview with Ted Turner, the media mogul. And uh, he sold off a lot of his things and become a part of big, big larger companies. But Turner was talking about in the interview how he does not think much about faith and finds particularly offensive the idea that there will be a savior. It really rubs him the wrong way. And here's the quote from the article. He said, when you look in the mirror in the morning, when you're putting on your lipstick or shaving, you're looking at the Savior. Now, I'd like to invite you to experiment with that idea. And it, this works great if you're married. If you have a roommate that really cares about you and you're a good, good friends, or just invite a good friend over. That'd work too. But you know, I think, just get your, get your spouse to come and Say, hey, sweetheart, come in here. I want you to stand in front of the mirror. You see that guy right there? The Savior. You know, once Rhonda gets off the floor from laughing about that, <laughs> see, that, you get a clear view of how this really works and how it doesn't work. How likely is it that you can be your own savior? And yet, that's the self-improvement plan. That's the, that's the build a bridge to God. That's a climb the mountain to God view that people have. And this is an important thing to know. What can you do and what can you not do? And the Bible says there's something you cannot do. You cannot save your own soul. It's too broken for you to fix it, to do a self-improvement plan. You can't earn your way into God's graces. You can't give enough. You can't do enough. You can't attend enough. You can't try hard enough. That's just a losing deal. But we live in a world where people are kind of counting on that. Just keep adding good things best we can to the, to the positive side of the scale. But here's the conversation I've had with, uh, with the scale people. How do you know when you're there? And I've had, I've had deathbed conversations with people. Had, okay, do, do you know? Do you think, well, I've been a pretty good person. You know, I've done some good things. And, you know, I was baptized when I was a kid. Uh, I think I'm okay. Do you know without a doubt that if you died today, you know this is all settled? Do you, do you know this? And the scales people can never know because there's, there's not a scoreboard being posted anywhere. They just, I hope it's enough. I hope I did enough, said enough, prayed enough, went to my place of worship enough, did good things, just enough. And there's a severe sense of insecurity. And you know what? There should be a severe sense of insecurity when that's how you're keeping score. The Bible says God has made another way. The Bible says God so loved the world, he wasn't willing that any should perish. God doesn't want to send people to hell. So he sent Jesus to the earth to live a real human life to, to demonstrate, you know, we want God. When things go bad in the world, what do we want? We want God to do something that's just, to make that right. Well, until it comes to us. Then we want a whole, a whole lot of slack cut our way. We, we don't want justice when it comes to us. Jesus came, and he lived the life that God wants everybody to live. He proved this is what it looks like. He showed, what's, what's God like? Look at Jesus in the Bible. You'll know exactly what God's like. You'll know how he does things. You'll know what's important to him. You'll know how he prioritizes things in life. You'll know who God is. And, and so we get, we get this uh, Jesus gift. We see God's heart. And then Jesus went to the cross and he died. And the Bible says when he died... He was taking on himself because it had to be someone who was perfect and there's only one who was perfect. And that was Jesus who proved that what God was asking for was just because Jesus lived the righteous, right with God, right with others' life. He took the sin debt for all of us on himself at the cross because the wages of sin is death. What we deserve because of sin is death. Jesus died on the cross to pay for that sin. And when he was raised from the dead, it proved he was God. 
it proved there really is just one way and it proved that we have the opportunity to have a relationship to God that lasts for all eternity because somebody beat death if, if out of all those religions I want to put my faith in someone for an eternal life I want to put my faith in the one who is not currently dead and buried I want to put my faith in the one who is today alive raised from the dead the Bible says God so loved the world he sent his son to die in our place that we could have forgiveness our, our, our sin debt wiped away we could, we could have his mercy we could have a life the way God intended it see God just wants to get us back on track from the broken part of us he wants to get us back on track to the life that is is designed to be lived for him and is purposeful and is accomplishing what he wants it to accomplish so when once you give your life to christ then you're back on track to god's perfect plan for your life it's not something you achieve by trying really hard you give up the self-improvement plan the mountain climbing plan and instead you accept this gift that god offers that's grace And people walk away from grace every day because they just want to earn it. Because if they think they can earn it, they also think they can control it. You got to give it up in order to receive it all. Now, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's a striking statement. And in a buffet-line spirituality kind of world in which we live, uh, that one is a real affront to, to a lot of folks. There's a whole faith, the Baha'i faith, and it is dedicated to uniting all religions. And its message is, we all believe the same thing. We all are going to the same place. It's going to work out for everybody. We've had, there are Baha'i temples in the Dallas area. Baha'i uh, temple members have marched in our Allen Christmas parade multiple years over the last several years. So they're here among us. and. This one's fairly recent as world religions go. There's a pretty good following. But here's what they say. We all believe the same thing. They say Buddha is a manifestation of God. Muhammad, uh, Moses, Confucius, Zoroaster, Jesus. In fact, it, it names nine different prophets that they're all just different manifestations of God. And Well, you know, Jesus just doesn't leave that option open. He said, I'm the way. I'm not one of nine ways. I'm the truth. I'm not one of nine truths. I'm the life. I'm not one of nine lives. You can accept him or you can reject him. The one thing you can't do is make him just a part of a conglomeration of self-styled religion. He didn't leave that open and he didn't intend to. Jesus says, I am the way. And I can throw all this down this morning. I can... I can tell you this, and I have, to, I have this message we say over and over and over again around here. We hear it in class, we hear it in seminars, we hear it from the platform. Uh, Jimmy spelled this out two weeks ago with great detail and, and so very clearly. It's only one way. And we're going to keep on telling this message, but I got to tell you. Uh, a lot of people who sit in church every Sunday say, that's, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Jesus said he's, a, he's the only way. But, you know, it seems like to me probably a lot of people are going to go no matter what they believe because we bought into the lie. And a lot of people who sit in church every Sunday, if I pressed you, and we're going to try to do more pressing, tell me how you know your sin's forgiven, you're going to heaven. Most people who are going to be in a church of any kind today, a Christian church, will say in answer to that question, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm read the Bible, and I, I go to church. I was bat- my parents had me baptized when I was a kid. And, you know, I, I, I attend a lot, and I volunteer uh, something at my church, and I'm a pretty good person. And that's what most people are attending church all the time. And you know, you know what that story tells? It tells someone who bought into the lie, and right now, their their ticket to heaven isn't punched. How about that? There's no assurance of salvation because there's no relationship to God. Doesn't mean you're not a good good neighbor. Doesn't mean you wouldn't be fun to go out and eat with at lunch today. But it means that eternity is not settled, and we just can't 
if that's the choice that people would make who go to church, at least here, I just want to make sure you have to climb over a whole lot of stuff to get there. And you're going to have to climb over me to, to get there without getting this really settled and really sure and really firm in your heart. God loves you and he, he reaches out to us and he says, I want to have a relationship with you. Not because you've done anything to deserve that. You're a sinner, separated from God. In, in incredible rebellion against him for even one sin. God sends Jesus to this world and he lives the sinless life. He is crucified by evil men, but as a part of God's plan to capture even what is bad in the world, he makes something eternal happen out of it. Jesus dies on the cross paying for all of our sin in God's great plan. And, and order, not because... He suffered so much that he was able to pay for the whole world's sin because what he did for six hours on the cross was the worst suffering anybody ever had. It's because of where he came from to do that suffering that makes it enough to pay for all sin for all time. He came in the glory of heaven to do that, and that's why it's sufficient payment. But he was raised from the dead. He's victorious over sin and over death and over hell and he loves you and as he reaches out to you in love and grace he's just inviting you to reach back in faith to say I believe what Jesus did I'm, nothing else not, not Jesus and Jesus or Jesus plus just Jesus what he did I'm putting all my faith in that he died on the cross he, I believe he paid for my sin I believe he was raised from the dead and, and I want to get off of the self improvement plan and I, I just want to follow Jesus with all my heart. And this is where it gets difficult for a lot of people because we, we, we come up with more excuses and we say, well, that might cost me something. I might have to change something. I, I have certain sins in my life that I really, I really love my sin. I want to hang on to some of these things. There's certain things I don't want to change about me. And so we walk into this like, okay, God, I know your plan, but... I, have, I kind of have my own plan still and I want you to work with me on this. I'm going to pay for this with smiles instead of it's God's plan or it's nothing. And what, what do you love about you and your self-style plan so much that you would allow it to keep you out of heaven and keep you from the life God really intends for you? What is so precious that it would, it would create that barrier? Listen, now's your time. Every time I found this in my, my spiritual life, at this stage of it, I've been a Christian and leaning into it fairly intensely for a long time. Every time I take a step toward God, every time I give Him my yes, every time I, I put some, I invest faith in Him, it just gets easier and it gets better. And here's what else happens. It'll be the same for you. You, your heart just gets more inclined toward him and every time you push him back and you say no and you say wait and you say later and you say not now and you say perhaps there's another plan your heart just gets a little bit harder and one day God's still calling out to you but the heart gets so hard you can't hear him anymore and you don't want to get to that place so today this is your time the Bible says today's the day of salvation you don't wait for this you don't put this off. You don't tap the brakes on this. I've got plenty of time. I can do this. And I'm still going to self-style it. I'm still going to manipulate it to be. Just, just say, I'm going to trust that God who loved me enough to send Jesus to die to pay for my sorry life. He's, uh, he's probably got some good things in mind for me. He's going to give me the best. He's going to give me everything I could, Im I could imagine and a whole lot more than that. And I'm going to trust him. So, you say to God, God, I'm not presenting the scales. I'm not presenting a resume of good stuff. I'm just saying guilty is charged, and I'm sorry. And I don't want to stay on that path. I sure want to turn away from that, but I know I can't do that by myself. I'm going to have to have, I'm going to have, to have Jesus to do that. I'm putting all my faith in Jesus. What he did at the cross paid for my sin. He was raised from the dead, and... I just want to, I want to follow him with all my heart for the rest of my life. Not because of me, 
but because of Jesus. And I want to know that one of these days I'm going to heaven, not because of me, but because of Jesus. He's going to have my best from, from this day forward, and he's got to help me be the best, because I sure can't do that yet by myself. You're saved by grace, God's unearned, unmerited favor through faith. I'm trusting in him and him alone, not him plus my works, not him or some other savior, him alone. But I'm putting it all out and I'm saying, God, my African friend, uh, I heard him leading in a prayer of commitment and he finishes it this way and sometimes I've finished it this way here. God, erase my name from the book of death because that's the default direction of all of our lives. Write my name today in your book of life. The Bible talks about that book of life. Name recorded in heaven. How glorious to know that's all settled. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to lead you in the kind of commitment prayer, saying the things I just talked about, just saying those things to God, which is prayer. And maybe as I pray this out loud, maybe this will give you some words to express your own heart to Jesus today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Maybe you'd pray. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge I am a sinner, a sinful person. I acknowledge my brokenness to you, the things I've done to hurt myself, to hurt others, to hurt you. I understand and believe Jesus came to this earth. On the cross, he died in my place. He paid the debt I owe to you. A debt I could never pay. So God, I commit my life to you. I reach, as you have reached out to me, I reach back to you for forgiveness and grace as best I can God from this day forward I will follow you with all my heart for the rest of my life looking forward to eternity in heaven thank you for this amazing gift my savior my lord is Jesus Christ amen